mistake. It's uh, translating it for us. It's rethinking it. This is NBC 24 News at 11 with Gretchen Auker, Kelly Durand with weather, and Megan West with sports. A routine tree trimming job ends in tragedy in West Toledo. And the Canadian skaters will get their gold medals, but sooner than anticipated. This is NBC24, your most local news station. Good evening, everyone. I'm Gretchen Auker. A Toledo man was electrocuted today while on a tree. Just a reminder, our NBC24 web polls are not scientific. The city of Toledo lost a good friend Friday. Jean Cook died at the Medical College of Ohio at the age of 70. Cook was the general manager of the Toledo Mud Hens for 20 years. He also spent a record 30 years in Toledo city government, serving as vice mayor and council president. But despite all his public accomplishments, Cook's family says they want him to be remembered as the man, who was, as the man he was behind the scenes. He was born in Mississippi, migrating to Ohio at the age of 12. Later, he would win nine athletic letters at the University of Toledo. Gene's son says his pride in his family was his very essence, and Gene's joy was having his wife, children, and grandchildren around him. Friends say he will be sorely missed. Gene was just an inspirational person, uh, more than an employer, and uh, you know we're all going to miss him tremendously. Funeral services will be held Wednesday at 1.30 at St. Patrick's Church on Heather Downs. Those planning an expression of sympathy can contribute to the Gene Cook Youth Athletic Fund at Heart Associates. That's on 1915 Indian Wood Circle in Maumee. Toledo Public School volunteers are making special house calls to help students Acupuncturist sitting in the dugout, the <laughs> therapy cells, and switch from ash to uh, hickory. Uh, there, <laughs> he probably knows the story on the hickory bat. And well, had a career year last year with the Indians, and if they don't sign Tommy, it could be even more of a sign of the times changing for Jim and the Indians. But uh, Jim's always been a key to this ball club. He's kind of been the spiritual leader, uh, the guy that everybody rallies around in that clubhouse. So I think keeping Jim is a key to that ball club if they're going to have success this year or years. Down the road. Does he bat first, or is he a cleanup hitter? Where does he? He's usually batting cleanup, and this mm -hmm. year he's going to be batting there too most of the, most of the time, and that's a good spot for him. I mean, he's been hitting uh, he's been hitting 50. I think he hit 50 home runs last year, so he's been a power uh, power hitter most of the time. And uh, it doesn't matter what bat he's using. Tim Tully's <laughs> always a good hitter. <laughs> Even if it was an aluminum bat, right? Exactly. Cranking him out in the leg. They're telling me to go to the break now. Now watch it. Now watch me wave the watch me wave okay. the break off. Go ahead. That's that's my wave no. off sign okay. right there. Okay, I'll go to the okay. break. We'll come back. We'll have a guest on tonight. We're going to go around the horn and uh, around Ohio, Toledo, Dayton, also back up the tribe, and also we'll be talking to uh, some Reds fans out there as well. Toll free tonight, one 888 h talks one 888 2557 Discover Chillicothe first. We're Ohio's first capital and the place to see the home of Thomas Worthington father of Ohio statehood, the place to see one of the nation's finest outdoor dramas, Tecumseh, the place to see a culture from another millennium, Hopewell Culture National Park. For history, fun, and entertainment, come discover us first. Come to Chillicothe, a gathering place, a principal town. Ah, vacations. They didn't always bring you peace, but at least you had peace of mind, knowing your car, family, and the home you left behind were all protected by State Farm. And now that you're older, we can offer you even more peace of mind with State Farm's deferred annuities, which offer you a choice of options and benefits, like a guaranteed monthly retirement income from a company recognized for financial strength. So call your State Farm agent today. All right, we talked a little bit of Tribe. Now we've got to get over to the Reds. The oldest professional sports team began their 134th season on Monday. Onan's Dan Franzak back on Ohio's Talking with Opening Day highlights in Cincy. All right, here we go, John. The Reds started their season, the final season in Synergy Field, this April 1st. No joke. Cincy has been fooling opponents for 32 years in the ballpark on the banks of the Ohio River. Next season, they'll be in the Great American Ballpark, which is a nice backdrop there for this afternoon's contest against the Cubbies. 1-0 Reds in the third, and they add to their lead on this RBI double to the left by Sean Casey. Ken Griffey Jr. scores two zips Cincinnati. Tied it two in the fifth for Todd Walker. Walker, who was hit in the head yesterday during practice, showing no signs of pain with a solo home run. 3-2 Reds. 
All right, tied at four now. Bottom of the ninth, bases loaded for Aaron Boone. Larkin tags up at third. Sammy Sosha's throw is there, but Larkin is safe. And the Reds hang on to win it five to four. The final, maybe that shot to the head helped out Walker. End of the day, <laughs> three for four. He had two doubles and a home run. So. Kind of a nice day for the Reds. Kind of a good, fantastic finish. They haven't gotten off to a winning start at home since, since 1997. Since 1997. Wow. Joining us now by phone from the great city of Cincinnati, Ohio, about opening day for the Reds Synergy Field and much more, Eric Stuckey, the senior assistant county administrator there in Hamilton County. Hamilton County owns Synergy Field, the current home of the Reds. The Great American Ballpark, the one under construction, that's the Reds' new home. And Paul Brown Stadium, home of the Cincinnati Bengals. Eric, thanks a lot for joining us tonight on Ohio's Talking. We appreciate it. Thank you. First of all, we're off on the right foot. That's going to be selling <laughs> tickets for the new ballpark, isn't it? You bet. Uh, success is a wonderful thing. This has uh, certainly been a long time coming. There was, uh, there was a lot of controversy regarding how we're going to fund it. We have the two stadiums. But right now, are we on time uh, to get the Reds into the new ballpark next year? Yeah, we definitely are. Uh, there's about 365 days away, but uh, everything is tracking on uh, online in terms of timing and, and budget looks good, and we're feeling very good about it. It's a very complex, challenging project, but things are, are really seem to be working well, and, and we're, we have high hopes for a year from now uh, when we open the doors on the, on, on the Great American Ballpark. Dan, uh, this is Dan Franzak from ONN Sports, Eric. Hey, I wanted to ask you, for the fans that are sitting in Synergy Field today, they were able to see the Great American Ballpark it being constructed. That's kind of a nice feature. What can they see from uh, anywhere in the stadium there at Synergy? Well, what they see now is they see the superstructure really coming up out of the ground, and, and later this month we will put the highest piece of steel in place, and so you're really seeing the skeleton of the ballpark uh, as it as it's going to look, uh, you know, it's really taken shape. Last year, you just really saw kind of an open area that was being worked and, and getting in shape, but now you really see it starting to take shape. So that's pretty exciting. Um, you know, during during uh, the game today, you could see uh, large pieces of steel being swung into place and worked on, and uh, so uh, you can see progress happening as you're enjoying the Reds. Uh, hopefully, win some more games. Eric, our viewers in northern Ohio know Jacobs Field pretty well. Does this new ballpark compare to Jacobs Field, or is there a, a ballpark around the United States that maybe is comparable to the new uh, Great American Ballpark? I think it is comparable to Jacobs uh, in, in terms of scale and size, and uh, I think people will be very pleased. Uh, you compare it to what the experience at Synergy, which, which is a great experience as well, but, the, but fans will find themselves at least 25 feet closer to the field everywhere around that ballpark park it'll be a ballpark built for baseball only have beautiful views of the Ohio River the banks of the Ohio and of uh, beautiful downtown Cincinnati so it's going to be just a great experience for baseball fans we'll also have uh, the Reds Hall of Fame will go up there the year following uh, the ballpark coming online they will construct the the Hall of Fame building in part of where Synergy Field is today and so it'll be a year-round baseball experience in a lot of ways for for Reds fans let me uh, work in a phone call tonight Eric Jordan sure. from uh, White Hall, Ohio. Hi, Jordan. Go right ahead. Hey, yeah, I was wondering, uh, compared to the Indians and the Reds, who would do better this year, you think? Yeah, that's the big, that's the only news web poll question this year. <laughs> well, they're, they're even right now. They're both uh, got one game on the thing. It's, it's going to be a difficult one because, uh, you know, everybody's cutting back on their budget, and we've seen the Reds do it for the past couple years, but the Indians haven't had to do it until this year. So it's going to be interesting to see. I think things are getting started pretty well. Uh, the Reds, their big question mark is pitching. The Indians do have a more solid pitching staff, so I would think the Indians have to get the edge, but you never know. We're early in the season. Obviously, health plays a big concern in that. As well. Eric, you know, what's the chances? Uh, what would an I 71 World Series do for the city of Cincinnati, for the Great American Ballpark for next year? Would that just be a win win for the entire state of Ohio? What kind of dollars are we talking about? Oh, with absolutely. Like that? It'd be a fantastic experience. Uh, it'd be a history making experience. And we'd, that'd be no better way to christen your new ballpark <laughs> than a World <laughs> Series. How about that? Absolutely. Now, <laughs> let, me, let me throw a little dark side on you, and I yes. want you to try to convince me otherwise. I'm still bitter from the strike back in 94. There was no World Series that year. Uh, 
Uh, we've seen the report come out in Forbes magazine about, well, how are we massaging the numbers here with these teams? Do you think that that is having a negative impact whatsoever for fans? Uh, uh, you know, is baseball still a good value for fans to get out there because we see the huge salaries that these players are making and, hey, more power to them if they can get that kind of money. But still, do you think that this may be leaving a bad taste in the fans' mouth? I, I hope not. I, I think fans have become somewhat desensitized to some of the business that you always hear about with the game. Uh, but, you know, I, I hope that it doesn't come to that again. I hope that we've learned the lessons of 94 and can, can learn to work together and keep things going because everybody loses in that kind of situation. Fans, players, owners, uh, you, you can't lose the goodwill of, of, of fans, and it took a lot to get it back. And I'd hate to see uh, uh, people lose that over over other issues. Um, there's just too much there's too much goodwill out there and too much to be lost by um, a short-term view and, and going on strike or having a lockout. Eric, what's your relationship with Major League Baseball, and what are they telling you about a possible strike again with a collective bargaining agreement between the players and the owners, and uh, how that would affect you guys next year, obviously, opening the new ballpark? Right. We really don't have a lot of information at this point on that. Uh, we know parties are are trying to, to, to get some discussions rolling because that's out there. We've heard, you know, pledges thrown out and about in the last week or two, but, uh, you know, we're not really, uh, we're, we're a bill owner we're not an operator of a team so we're a, a step or two removed from that although we're very interested in that but I I don't really have any great uh, insight to, to report to you on that <laughs> let me work in a, another phone call from uh, maybe a Reds fan down in Portsmouth Ohio southern tip of Ohio hi Dale go right ahead hi how's everyone good Dale. great hey I had a question about um, this feeds right into what mr. Stucky was talking about about ticket prices for next year when the um, GAB opens how about the ticket prices, uh, Eric? Yeah, the Reds just announced their ticket prices oh, probably about a month ago, and um, the, there are going to be some, some more expensive seats, but but uh, some of the other seats are are still pretty affordable and still on the uh, lower end of major league averages. So I, I think they've been conscious of that when they set their prices. Uh, granted, there are going to be some higher ticket prices in in some certain you know sort of premium sure. seating areas, but uh, they've also tried to be sensitive to the the common fan and <laughs> the folks that that may not have a ton of money to to put towards going to a game to try to keep still keep it attractive. Uh, it, it, it will, they will be a commodity, though, because I think people will be excited to see the new ballpark and be a part of it. That's part of the Jacobs Field factor that, that folks saw up in Cleveland, that uh, it renewed interest in the game and the excitement of being in a, in a new ballpark, but a ballpark built solely for baseball and, and focusing entirely on baseball, the baseball experience. So it will probably increase demand, but I think the Reds have done a pretty good job of trying to balance out uh, you know, the economic value of a new stadium with the need to keep it affordable for, for your fans that have been with you for, for years and years. You know, when we talk about the fans, too, and all the negative uh, coverage that has uh, resulted since last April in Cincinnati, it seemed with the parade today, it really was kind of a coming together of uh, all different races, ethnicities, just baseball fans, Cincinnati Reds fans, and that's extremely important to downtown Cincinnati. And I would think this would be an issue, Eric, where maybe all of Hamilton County, the people who live in Cincinnati, regardless of where you live, could come together and just enjoy a day out there at the ballpark. Absolutely. We, you know, it's a reminder that we have so much more in common and we share so much more than we have differences. And, and that's not just about sports, but that's about what we value in our families and in our community. And, and the more we focus on what we share together, I think the better things are for everybody. What are we talking capacity-wise with the new ballpark here? The new ballpark will be very similar to modified Synergy Field. It, it's about 43,000 seats. And like I said, you're going to find yourself at least 20 to 25 feet closer to the to home plate every place in the ballpark when you compare to a comparable seat at Synergy. You know, Eric, I forgot to ask you what happens to the old ballpark. What happens to Synergy? Well, Synergy Field will come down at the end of, ba of the baseball season this year, which we're hoping will be November because after the World Series is over, uh, then we'll take Synergy Field down. But uh, if, if by chance the Reds don't make it into, uh, into uh, late into October, uh, a week or two after the season is over, Synergy Field will come down. Now, we do not know what method that will be. We are waiting for 
uh, Environmental Protection Agency officials to give us some guidance on that. It may be imploded, or it may have to be taken down uh, more traditional piece-by-piece piece demolition. Somebody will want a piece-by-piece piece of that to take home and uh, <laughs> yeah. frame it on right. their mantle. Hey, Eric, thanks a lot for talking to us tonight. We thanks appreciate for having it. Me on. We're going to stop here, take a break, and we're going to come back. We'll be talking still about the Cincinnati Reds, but we'll be talking about their single-way team, the Dayton Dragons. The toll-free tonight, one 888 talks one 888 It's rare to find a bank that works to save me money, but Mark at National City showed me that when I have my home equity loan payments deducted from my National City checking account, I'd actually lower my loan's interest rate. I was single, low on capital, and starting my own company, but that didn't stop Elaine at National City from getting me what I needed. Now my business is growing, and Elaine is still my banker. I got a new job in a new city. I wanted to bank when and where it was convenient for me. Garrett National City took care of me. I've got ATMs everywhere. Free checking, a Visa check card, and online banking. Gary understood me, but that's no surprise. Because the people at National City don't see me like this. They see me for who I really am. I'm Brian Spencer, and my bank is National City. I'm Linda Murphy, and my bank is National City. I'm Robert Sanchez, and my bank is National City. Ohio's Talking on ONN. All right, let's throw you a change up tonight. We're going to be talking about the Dayton Dragons. And joining us now by phone is Eric Deutsch, the Executive Vice President of the Dayton Dragons. Eric, thanks for your time. First of all, we want to make it clear that you guys are the single-way farm team for the Reds. Is that still right? Yes, that is correct. Okay, and how's that new stadium working out? We, well, we it, did several stories on it. It looks beautiful. It's actually uh, been working out great. It, we're going into year three. There's about 7,200 actual stadium seats. We have some overflow lawn areas, some group, uh, great group party deck areas. We have 30 suites in the stadium it's uh it's it's a fabulous ballpark eric it's really revitalized the town of dayton hasn't it yeah i think what it's, it's helped to do is create uh, a new perception about downtown dayton that it is okay and safe and fun to come downtown and it's also been a good uh, jump start to a lot of other projects that have gone on in downtown i think currently right now we're completing a phase of 60 million dollars of redevelopment in terms of downtown projects and it includes a, a new performing arts center, uh, Riverscape, which is a rebuilding of the downtown riverfront, as well as many nightclubs, condominium apartment uh, housing projects. Uh, a lot of things going on in downtown Dayton right now. Let me uh, go from southwest Ohio and uh, hold the line there, Eric. But I also want to talk to Scott Jeffer tonight by phone, the assistant GM with the Toledo Mud Hens. Hey, Scott, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. No problem. When's opening day for you guys? A week from tomorrow, a week a from April the 9th. And who do you play? Uh, we play the Norfolk Tides, the, the, the New York Mets AAA affiliate. And uh, how's attendance been here lately? Uh, obviously, uh, the Mud Hens, that certainly rings. Uh, everybody knows about the Mud Hens from the <laughs> days of MASH when the uh, sitcom was on. Uh, how is AAA ball right now? Well, AAA ball is, is outstanding, and, and it's an exciting time for us. With uh, Actually, a week from tomorrow will be our first game in our new ballpark downtown. And you mentioned MASH, Corporal Klinger will be on hand to hey. throw out the first pitch, Jamie Farr. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't have it any other way. And he won't be dressed like a woman, though, right? That's I, I hope not. <laughs> Actually, that's why we sent them all those jerseys to get him out of the dresses. <laughs> and uh, it, it sure helped the souvenir sales, that's for sure. Hey, you know, when we talk so much, we talk, uh, here we are in Northwest Ohio, Southwest Ohio, the Mud Hens are triple way, the Dragons are single way, but we're talking about farm, uh, farm clubs for the Mud Hens or the Detroit Tigers and the Cincinnati Reds with the Dayton Dragons. Uh, Eric, when we we talk about that entertainment dollar. Do you find yourself competing against the Mud Hens, against people just going right over to Cincinnati to watch a Reds game? How tough is it to compete for that entertainment dollar for baseball fans? Well, I think anytime that you're you're going to be having people spend some entertainment dollars in a certain direction, that there's going to be competition. I think that people go down to Cincinnati for a certain thing and they want to see the big league clubs or they want to see when the Sammy Sosas or the uh, Ken Griffey Juniors or whoever their favorite players are come to town or, or just to catch the big the big red team when it's in town. I, I think that when people come to the Dragons, they're looking for a, a quick night out to run into, um, to bring out their family or run into neighbors, uh, people they might go to church with, uh, em employees, clients. I think it's just more of a uh, your local team atmosphere. Scott, I have a question for you. This is Dan Franzak from ONN Sports. Hey, Being Dan. so close to Detroit, do you find a lot of people coming down from Detroit to kind of scout out the new players that they're going to get up there in the Tigers organization? Or 
How, what, are, what are your majority of your fans there in Toledo? Yeah, they want to know who's playing for the Tigers the upcoming week. <laughs> they come down to Toledo. Yeah. Uh, we get about 30, 30, 25% to 30% of our crowd is from the state of Michigan. At least it was last year. Wow. Now we're going to have some dramatic changes with the new down, downtown ballpark, and that should bring a lot of additional exposure. But, yeah, there are a lot of people that do cross over the border. But, you know, we also play Columbus, uh, Louisville, which is uh, the Cincinnati Reds AAA team, and we also play Buffalo, which is the Cleveland Indians AAA team. So we get a lot of Ohio fans just for those three teams as well. Do you guys play the Clippers, Scott? The Clippers, yeah. The Columbus Clippers. You know, and when we think about all the, uh, and people who are Columbus Clipper fans have seen Derek Jeter go up, right. Doc Gooden go up, all the big names go up. Scott, when that happens, and Eric, same question for you, but Scott, I'll have you answer first. When you lose that premier player at the AAA level and they go up to Detroit, you know, does that impact your attendance whatsoever? Zero. Um, you now, it does impact it when, when the guy gets called down for rehab assignment. Or so, like when Sandy Elmar Jr. one year was called down, all of a sudden an extra 5,000 people showed up a couple few years back. But um, you, people go out, kind of what Eric was saying before, they go out for the entertainment. You know, we're, we're not competing with these other teams as much as we're competing with just someone wanting to go into the, to the movies or the zoo or the art museum or something like that. So it, it affects it uh, only for the positive one uh, or, ne or negative half you view of John Rocker's appearance, whatever you want to call that. <laughs> but uh, uh, when the, uh, the Deion Sanders yeah. and the Jeters and those guys come in, it's, it's pretty good. Eric, same question for you. Right. It's, it's funny is that I think we've had a certain kind of honeymoon in that today's Dayton Dragons can be tomorrow's Reds, and we saw that with Adam Dunn last year and again this year. But a lot of the same things apply to that some Dayton Dragons for today will be tomorrow's bankers, lawyers, doctors, businessmen, etc., because a lot of these guys won't make it down to a major league park, and the fans do understand that, and, and they're rooting for the guys to, to do well and climb the ladder, but at the same time, they know that these guys are facing some long odds, and they're giving it their shot, and they're hustling every play and playing hard, and, and the names will change, and hopefully you'll see them down in the Great American Ballpark in Cincinnati someday. Eric, along the same lines, uh, what was it like when Deion Sanders came to uh, Dayton, and I think Ken Griffey Jr. was there for a little bit, too. Yeah, Dion never did make it to Dayton. I think he, he was at Louisville for a while. But we did get uh, Ken Griffey doing a little rehab with us uh, while the team was on the road. He had the entire ballpark to himself, created quite a stir. We did get Jose Rio, who pitched, wow. uh, I believe, an inning or two with us uh, last July 4th. And that created a big stir since he was the World Series MVP. And I tell you, there was people lined up around the, the gates uh, about five deep trying to get into what had already been a sold-out game a couple days in advance. And it was quite a stir. Hey, Scott, how long have the Mud Hens been around? Uh, the team has been around. We were a major league team back in 1883 and 84, my first couple of years with the team. <laughs> and then in 1896 was when they actually named the Toledo Mudhands. So it's it's been a, a, a historic. Uh, uh, we're going from the outhouse to the penthouse as far as our, our stadium. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's just an exciting time. Uh, it's been 40 years since we were uh, at the last stadium, and it's going to be a big year for us. Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Actually, it wasn't Jackie Robinson, but actually Fleet Walker, the first African-American yep. to play Major League Baseball. Well, I can't correct you because you're, you're correct. 1884, Moses Fleetwood Walker, uh, the first, the unofficial, or official, I should say, uh, first African-American ball player did play in Toledo. And what were they called then? The Blue Stockings, is that correct? The, they were the Blue Stockings, the Mommies. They, they had a couple of weird names. And then finally, 1896, they renamed it the Mud Hands after, uh, after this bird that used to roll around in the outfield. <laughs> they tried to switch it one year in 1953 to the Glass Sox, and then the, the town revolted, and a half the season later, they switched it back. Now it's just the Canada geese out there in the outfield. <laughs> uh, uh, Dan Franzak, the stat man tonight. And also, I was going to ask, uh, isn't uh, the Dayton Dragons, uh, Eric, and also the Mud Hens, Scott, uh, both your stadiums, Fifth Third Stadium? Yeah, that's right. It works so well in Dayton that we uh, we said, well, that's a good idea. Let's go. In fact, they just put up the final fifth third field sign uh, today. How important is it to get, uh, because, you know, Synergy Field, uh, the Great American Ballpark, we're naming all these stadiums. How much of a part of the business game is that, guys? Well, just don't choose Enron and you're in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's full of them today. <laughs> well, Eric, how big, of a, how big of an issue is uh, naming rights even for a, a single-A team even in the minors? I'd say you definitely have some revenue opportunities there for the team as well as a great marketing opportunity for a company looking to, to definitely brand itself as the, as the hometown uh, company. We had a, a great partner in Fifth Third Bank, great leadership, great uh, management team over there, and it was just was a great match. I think um, in looking at who we could partner with, they were definitely one of uh, the top on our list, and it's turned out to be a, a great marriage thus far.
Guys, we only got one minute left, and I'll give you 20 seconds apiece. Eric, I'll start with you. The reason to go see the Dragons play this year is what? I think it's just going to be a, a different show every night. It's entertainment. It's not so much who wins or loses, but uh, taking the family or the company or your friends out and having a good time at the ballpark with good seats, good, good meal, and good value. Scott? An hour and a half from Cleveland, two hours or so from Dayton and Columbus, and three hours from Cincinnati. We're, we're within range. $8 a maximum ticket. It's a good time, and Muddy the Mud Hen is a legend. <laughs> we'll come see you. Scott, Eric, Dan, thanks a lot for talking to us no tonight. No problem. Thank I appreciate you. it, Ohio. Go out to the ball game. Have a good time. Thanks for talking to us. And remember, we're always listening.